Does anyone else want to answer that question? The question is about the financing of the film. Hello. Hello. I'm Brent. Uh, Miles and I met on another project that Sean and I were also working on. Saw the short, absolutely loved it. Um, myself and my company helped produce some fun films, so we decided to start running with it. And budget I will not get into here, but you know we we found a few others like close family and friends that we shared the project with first and foremost, and the reaction was just phenomenal. And some folks might have noticed on the EP card there was a lot of similar last names. And yeah. <laughs> many, many of those, uh, actually all of those are my uh, family members. They were so blown away by Miles and this project that I, uh, I suckered my family into this. But <laughs> now, now I get to get excited. Pretty much the low point of the film for me, but um, yeah, All right. and, yeah. Um, th that was actually in the script. Those shots were in the script, so um, maybe Miles can address <laughs> what's that. The division behind. <coughs> navigate between this high A um, aspect ratio and the and, and, and the kind of widescreen feel that we were going to have to really make that pop and really make that formal difference um, really implicate that in the storytelling. So <clears throat> for us that stuff, at least for me, and kind of tell, telling that story was a way of us detaching in a way from, from the subjectivity of the characters, because a lot of it is completely within their subjectivity. Um, and also, you know, we, we talked a lot about memory um, and how, especially teenagers, construct their memories and the sort of cinematic language that we use to construct those, uh, those memories and the grandiosity of, of, like, skipping school and things like that, these things that are very uh, sort of commonplace in a way, or, or you wouldn't think of as these kind of moments. Um, and for me, the movie was really about creating a film where those moments, those things that those kids are experiencing are dealt with just as seriously as anything else, you know? So it isn't a huge action, action sequence or it isn't something like that, but, but the emotional content of what that feeling is for them, the freedom that they're experiencing running through there, um, that was why we, we chose to use that. And then, you know, definitely being aware that the two places we use that are kind of these entrances and exits of these two very different worlds and the kind of collision of those things, whether it's the school or the woods where the final incident takes place. Uh, yes, over here. Yeah, I, uh, in my mind, it was, a, it was a love story on several levels. It was really cool, even between the mother and the son and then the different <laughs> teenagers. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you cast these actors. Um, I, I was invested in all of them. Yeah, the, I mean, just about the, the casting, we got incredibly lucky uh, right off the bat with our, our casting director, Jessica Kelly and Rebecca Daly, who, who did it. Um, they, you know, have been doing it a long time in, in, in New York and had kind of like a database of all these kids who were going to come in and read. And the first person we actually cast in the film was, was Amanda Lewis, just because we were kind of looking at all these different people and who we were going to make offers to, who we were going to audition to, and whenever we were looking at who we wanted to play Sarah, these pictures of Amanda kept coming up, and we were like, well, someone like Amanda, something kind of like this. And our casting director was like, no, I'll call her. 
so she did, and she wrote the script and we dug it. So that was kind of the first piece, and then we started auditioning a bunch of kids, and I'm sure that some of you have been in audition rooms before, and normally, a lot of times when actors come into audition rooms, it's like the biggest performance you've ever seen, where they're trying to crush the role so hard that there's like nowhere to breathe in the performance, you know? Um, which is just like a byproduct of the incredibly uncomfortable atmosphere that is an audition. Owen came in and literally did nothing. He... <laughs> I, don't even, I don't know if he read the lines even, but there was something watching him that I was like, I can't take my fucking eyes off this kid. Like, he's so good at doing nothing. <laughs> which, which is really hard. It's way harder than doing something. Um, so he was immediately, we were all just like, oh, this is, this is the dude. He's like, you want to watch him. You want to love what he loves. You want him, you know, you want him to feel good, but you understand when he does it. You know, there was just like a real emotionality to him that he wasn't pushing. Charlie Heaton was like a crazy discovery because at first he was like English, he's living in London. He really wanted to do the film and we were like, when are we going to cast an English kid? play some kid from Albany, New York. Like, we'll get, like, any of our buds to do it. And then he, like, kept reading for parts and, like, would just start, like, Skyping me at random times. <laughs> and we'd be like, hey, man, what can I do better? And, like, and just, like, kept doing it until it got to a point that it was like, whoa, no, this kid is, like, the real deal and is really so engaging to watch. And not just that, is, like, intends and put, wants to put in so much work to this. Um, and that's kind of, it's hard to find a kid who's going to do that. Um, so that was, I mean, Mary Stewart Masterson and, and Scott Cohen were kind of revelations. And I actually got out, added onto the project later than we would have been comfortable with, <laughs> um, like a few days before. Um, <laughs> but it was always like this thing, like, can we get Mary Stewart Masterson? Like, she, like, she's perfect for the, for the part, especially with the time when the movie takes place and how her career is done. It's so perfect. And then we did, and she engaged with it so well and so articulately, and has kids, and has been kind of off of the screen for a while because she's been raising a family, you know. So she brought so much to that part that was kind of indispensable. Like I, as a 23-year-old guy, can't tell her like this is how a mother feels, <laughs> you know. Uh, I tried it. Well, it didn't work. <laughs> but so that was huge for us. And Scott Cohen, the same thing. I mean, he was just so engaged with the process immediately and so engaged. I mean, it had to be immediate because it was the day before we shot a scene. <laughs> but, yeah. We have a question with glasses, yeah? yeah. Um, first of all, how many shoot days have you had? And also, um, I love your decision with how you shot an anamorphic film within the 185 frame and how, you know, trying to match the characters, how they didn't fit to a box. Uh, can you explain your decision to do that? Kill the dude. Um, question, the question is about uh, how many days you shot and then uh, the artistic decisions you chose with the, the framing uh, ratio. Yeah, we shot 24 days, 29 locations. Right? Wow. 21 set locations. 21 set locations. But there's some impromptu. Sure, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, but I'm going to let Caleb talk more about the, the aspect ratio and stuff. The one thing I will say is that what we wanted to do is tell a story of interrogation differently. Um, and part of that was to actually have the physical frame and the limits of the frame changing. Um, I'll let him talk more about that. Yeah, so that, because um, we, that was already part of the discussion from the very beginning that, um, that there would be this change in aspect ratios. And that's what determined, uh, because you know, the, the anamorphic stuff is normal 2.4 to 1. But because the, uh, the high eight footage is four by three, we ended up meeting the, the, the masters 1.85 so that we could kind of make the most of both of those formats. Um, and and you, also just to be clear, because if you were to not do that, then it would, the high eight would be a box inside of a box, you know what I mean? It was important to get that extra up. Yeah, it worked great on this, on this screen. Um, and the decision to shoot anamorphic had to do with uh, what we felt was the subjective quality that we got out of it, especially older anamorphic lenses that were actually from the early 1990s. 
as was the high eight pyramid. So it was all very fitting and um, in the period. There's all in the well, back right there was the jacket called blazer. Yes, you. <laughs> Can you put your hand up so I can see it? Yeah. And um, I was so wondering what that was like for Kuso Flos uh, in scoring production of music, uh, as well as building it and how they tied into one another. Uh, the, I'm asking about the, the music. That was something that was, I mean, actually, like, the whole thing was fun, guys. But doing the music was, like, one of the most fun things ever because um, I did it with this guy, Patrick Higgins, who, if you don't know his band Z's, Yes, you should check it out. He's really a phenomenal, phenomenal musician and producer and has this incredible recording studio in Hudson, New York that's a church. Um, we, I had composed and had a lot of ideas about kind of the chorales that we wanted for the characters and themes and different textures, but I'm not a very good musician and he is a very good musician. So I kind of, we wanted, we wanted the music to really flow through it in this kind of dreamy way and, and, and go through a lot of different textures as the film did. Um, and so I would kind of present him, you know, these like chord progressions, these very simple chord progressions, and then he would make them good, basically. You guys have another question? Yeah. Um, I'm glad you got the phone call from Sundance, number one. Me too, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Because that's a big, big deal. Um, I'm very interested in the editing process and the relationship between you and the editor, given the time frame that you told us that you had to get that completed film here. Uh, I mean, it's crafted so beautifully on all levels, but I really want to hear about the editor. Well, Abby is the editor. Um, we, just real quick, you can talk more, because she obviously was going crazy um, to make this thing in the deadline. We had, I think, 15 days to do the first cut to try and submit, and they got asked to... After shooting ended. Yeah. After shooting ended, we had 15 days to make a first cut to submit. Um, so Abby worked on one half, <laughs> or like on three-fourths, and I worked on it. And then we put it together, and that was the first time we'd seen it together, and sent it to him, and it was like two hours and 15 minutes, and we were like, oh, we're bummed. This is gonna be a nightmare. And they asked for another cut, in four days, five days? I believe we had a week, but it was the week that you went up to record. Yeah, the soundtrack. <laughs> so this is how good Abby is. I walked into uh, to where we were cutting and we had all of our cards up and I couldn't stay to edit with her because I was going to the studio. So I just looked at the cards and started tearing things down off the wall. And I was like, you just do that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> with no idea if it would work or not. And then I left and came back and was cut and, and worked and she, uh, I don't know what she did, but it was all, <laughs> all that exactly that point. We have time for one more question. Can she speak? Oh, sorry, I don't, no, please I, speak some more. I don't really have that much more to say about it other than that it was a wonderful experience working with Miles. He was in the cutting room pretty much every day other than when he was recording the score. And it was fantastic and very, very fun to be with him every day. You too, Abby. <laughs> okay, one more question. Uh, right here in the middle of the black. So what exactly happened to the ending? <laughs> Great question, man. Can we do one more question? <laughs> Next question. We saw one over here. Yes. Good question. Uh, the question I'll... was, what was the appeal about setting the film in the 90s? Uh, I'll say a little bit about this, and imagine asking to say something about the self secret with the film with me. Um, I think that when you're starting to tell a story, you kind of look at the whole world as tools to tell that story. Um, what we really wanted to tell was the story of immediacy, of the immediacy of these relationships between people. Um, and kind of looking at location, looking at technology, looking at all those things, of how we could tell that in the clearest way. Um, Basically, none of the issues I think that teenagers are going through in this capacity have changed in any real way. The difference is the way that we cope with it, whether that's through social media or whether that's through anything. The, the coping mechanisms have changed. 
but that emotion is still completely existent. Um, so setting it when we set it allowed us to really focus on them, and really focus on them looking at each other instead of looking at their phone or living inside of another community. Um, also kind of the socio-political climate then was really important because, you know, it's coming out of Reagan and this kind of like re uh, re-establishment of like family values and gender roles and masculinity and femininity and what those things mean and these characters are trying to figure out those things for themselves but are stuck inside of this world where you know the, Tom the father thinks that he's identified through his masculinity and through his like authoritativeness and Karen at the beginning thinks that she identifies herself through the, the man that she's with and that's kind of her thing to get through so being able to have all of that in the background without needing to say it as much um, was part of what interested me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not it's not what the film is about, but the I mean that was sort of a big transitionary time before before the technology started being this accessible thing, um, and that's huge. I mean, it's all happened so fast that it's like it seems like it's always been there. I mean, for us being the age that we are. Um, so, so yeah, so also like this, the isolation of it, you know, of, of not being able to get it, go on the internet and, and find a community that's not a real community. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't exist in real space, but, but to not have that band-aid that you can put on it, um, I think is really important in terms of what each character is feeling. Each character is isolated. Um, so that was that was a big part of, of why that choice was made. Thank you. I'm sorry that's all the time we have. But thank you so thank much you for being here. Thank you. Along with us. Please don't forget to vote on top of the game in the dramatic competition. As the U.S. dramatic competition is also eligible for the audience award. So uh, if you didn't get any ballots, you can get some on your way out. Thank you so much.